this book on Alexander the Great, this biography, is uh, written by a colonel who uh, saw action in the Civil War. It was originally published in 1890 by um, a man named Theodore Irolt Dodge. And uh, interestingly, well, because of the time mainly, but it should be noted that um, he filled this biography with a, uh, an abundance of line drawings. And um, obviously they didn't have the opportunity to take pictures of artifacts, sculptures, mosaics, that kind of thing. But uh, he, uh, he did some pen and ink drawings uh, of, uh, you know, maps, um, armory, uh, etc. Um, it's just filled with it, but I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, interesting in the sense that this book was actually written for, um, uh, it's more of a soldier's education in the art of war at a time when they were still calling it an art, you know, I mean, uh, um, it's important to keep that in mind. Um, yeah, so anyway, uh, I thought I'd give it a flip. And uh, just a little bit about the author. Uh, on the in sleeve here. Lieutenant Colonel Theodore Erolt Dodge was born in Massachusetts and served as an officer in the New York Volunteer Infantry during the Civil War. He saw action at Gettysburg and was decorated for gallantry and meritorious service. His early writings on the Civil War were followed by works on European campaigns and studies of the great captains. In the opening, there's a dedidactory to the American soldier, who not bred to arms but nurtured by independence, has achieved the proudest rank among the veterans of history. This volume is dedicated. Um, below that, there are some uh, entries by Napoleon. They are both in French. Um, I'm not going to attempt that, although I could read it through and transliterate, but my French would be horrid, and I'm not going to take that chance. So I'm going to go directly to the preface. The basis of this history is the Anabasis of Alexander by Arian of Nicomedia, who lived in the second century of our era. Arian was surnamed in Athens the younger Xenophon because he occupied the same relation to Epictetus, which Xenophon did to Socrates. This historian is by far the most reliable, plain, and exact of all those who have told us of the great Macedonian. Arian, though a Greek, was long in the service of the Roman state, having fallen into the good graces of the emperor Hadrian, whom he accompanied to Rome, and who later appointed him prefect of Cappadocia, under Antioch Antonius Pius, Arian rose to the supreme dignity of consul. He wrote several philosophical and historical treatises, among them an account of his own campaign against the Alani. Arian was himself a distinguished soldier, and it is 
this which enables him to make all military situations so clear to us. Of the fifteen works which we know he wrote, the Anabasis is the most valuable. Arian had in his hands the histories of Ptolemy, son of Lagus, one of Alexander's most distinguished officers, later king of Egypt, and of Aristobulus, a minor officer of Alexander's. He also used the works of Eratosthenes, Megasthenes, Nerkus, Alexander's famous admiral, Aristus, and Asclepiades, as well as had access to all which had been written before him, a large part of which he rejected in favor of the testimony of those who served under Alexander in person. He quotes from the king's own letters and from the diary of Eumenes, his secretary, which he appears to have had at hand. Next to Arian's history comes that of Quintus Curtius, who wrote in the first century. Of ten books, the eight last are extant. This work is far behind Arian's credibility. Curtius is somewhat of a romancer, though he gives local color and occasionally supplies a fact missing in Arian. But he is neither clear nor consistent. He draws his facts largely from Clitarchus, a contemporary of Alexander. Plutarch, 50, to 130 AD is always interesting and his short life of Alexander is just and helpful. Many stray facts can be gleaned in the other lives. Diodorus Siculus, a contemporary of Caesar and Augustus in his historical library, gives us many items of worth. Out of his 40 books, only 15 have survived. Diodorus is suggestive, but must be construed in the light of other works. Justinus, a Roman historian who lived in the 2nd or 3rd century AD, wrote a history of Macedonia. This ranks with Diodorus in usefulness. The chapters relating to Philip and Alexander supply some gaps and give an occasional glimpse into the character of these monarchs lacking elsewhere, but one cannot rely on Justin unsupported. Strabo's geography first century contains material which ekes out what we glean elsewhere, and there are in many of the old authors, Dionysius, Livy, Josephus, Frontinus, Ammian, and others, frequent references to Alexander which can be drawn from. Vegetius Diuri Militari is somewhat mixed, but very valuable. Onosanders Strategos can be put to use in explaining tactical maneuvers. Polybius, one of the most valuable of all our ancient sources of information, military and political, in his universal history, strays off to Greece, Asia Minor, and Egypt, and we find some material in his pages. He lived in the 3rd century. There were numberless historians of Alexander. Very few have survived. Raphael Volterin quotes Clitarchus. Polyariates one Secretus and Tigenus, Istrus, Aristobulus, Charis, Hecatius, Eritreus, Philip, the Chalcidian, Durus, the Samian, 
Ptolemy, Anticlides, Philo the Theban, Philip, His Angelus, Antith Antisthenes, Menachemus, the Sicyonian, Nymphus of Heraclea, Potamon, the Mytilenean, Sotericus, Arcites, Arian, Plutarch, Quintus Curtius. Plutarch quotes most of the above, and Callisthenes, Eratosthenes, Polycletus, Hermippus, and Socian beside. Most of these authors did not long survive their own era, but they were known to those whose works have remained to us, and were by them accepted or rejected according to the credibility of each. It may be claimed that Arian furnishes us the main body of all histories of Alexander. Other sources are, as it were, appendices, and this because the trained military mind of Arian enabled him to distinguish clearly between what was valuable and consistent and what was manifestly incredible or unimportant. The early chapters about the military art preceding Philip come mainly from Herodotus, Thucydides, and Xenophon. Cornelius Nepos draws a clever character, and we all know what a fund of riches Plutarch lays before us, available for all purposes, if not always exact. So much for the facts. But the ancient authors rarely give more than just the bold facts in dealing with military matters. They tell us where Alexander went and what he did, with sketches of character and interesting incidents, but they furnish no clue to the special way and wherefore which the soldier likes to know, or if a clue quite frequently a wrong one. What to us is clear, because the art which Alexander created has since been expanded by the deeds of the other great captains, and elucidated by their commentators, was even to Arian a sealed book. Arian did not understand what Alexander did as Jumini would have understood it, for it needed the remarkable campaigns of a Frederick and a Napoleon to enable Jumini to compass the inner meaning of the art of war. This meaning we must seek in modern military criticism. There is by no means a perfect sequence to the origin and growth of the art of war. Its continuity has been interrupted by periods of many centuries. But as all great soldiers have acknowledged their indebtedness to their predecessors, though they themselves have been able to improve upon the art, so it is interesting and instructive to study what these predecessors did, and see from what small beginnings and through how many fluctuations the art has grown to its present perfect state. There have been many lives of Alexander written in modern times, some within this generation. Much of the best of military criticism has been devoted to this subject. It is hard to say anything about Alexander that some one may not have already said, but a good deal contained in this volume, in the way of comment, is new, and the author does not know of a life of Alexander, which, by the way, of such charts and maps 
as bound in the histories of our own civil war, makes the perusal of this great conquest an easy task. The military student is willing to devote his days to research. He should not rely on others. The general reader has no leisure for such work. He has a right to demand that his way should be made plain. The author has tried to do just this, while not neglecting the requirements of those who wish to dwell upon the military aspect of Alexander's campaigns. There is no mystery about the methods of great captains. A hundred years ago there was, but Jomini and his followers have brushed away the cobwebs from the secret and laid it bare. The technical details relating to war are intricate and difficult, nor are they of interest to the general reader. They take many years to learn. No officer who drops for an instant his studies can save himself from falling behind his fellows, especially if the true t especially is this true today. This, however, relates chiefly to the minutiae of the profession. The higher the art of the soldier goes, the simpler it is, because it becomes part of his own individuality. But the captain must first have mastered every detail of the profession by the hardest of work. He must be familiar with the capacities and limitations of every arm of the service and be able to judge accurately what ground each needs for its march, its maneuvers, and its fire. He must be so apt a businessman as never to fail in providing for his troops, however fast he moves or however far from his base. He must be an engineer of the first class. Almost all Greek generals have been able to drill a company, or serve a gun, or throw up a breastwork, or conduct a reconnaissance better than most of their subordinates. Intimate knowledge of detail is of the essence. Ad astra per aspera. Having reached the top, the captain's work is less intricate in one sense. Nothing is more beautifully simple than the leading features of the best campaign of Napoleon. We may all understand them, but too few indeed has the power ever been given to conceive and execute such a masterpiece. A bare half dozen men in the world's history stand in the highest group of captains. The larger operations of war are in themselves plain, but they are founded on complicated detail. War on the map, or strategy, appears to us in the event easy enough, but to conceive and develop and then move an army in pursuance of a strategic plan requires the deepest knowledge of all arts and sciences applicable to war. And such exertion, mental, moral, and physical, as is known to no one but the commander of a great army in time of war. The simple rest upon the difficult. What is treated of in this book is not, as a rule, the minutia, but the larger operations, though details have sometimes to be dealt, dwelt on for their historical value. What is difficult to do may be easy to narrate. There is no pretense to make this a military textbook. It contains nothing but what the professional soldier already knows. A military textbook is practically useless to the general reader. Even Jomini acknowledged that he could not make his books interesting except to professionals, and there are now enough good textbooks accessible to those who wish to study the technical side of war. 
but it is hoped that the presentation may commend itself to these military men whose studies in their peculiar branch of the profession have led them in other directions, and who may wish to refresh their knowledge of Alexander's campaigns, even if they do not agree with all the conclusions reached. It is assumed by some excellent military critics that there are no lessons to be learned from antiquity. This was not what Frederick and Napoleon thought or said. It is certainly difficult to, to develop a textbook of the modern science from ancient campaigns alone. Illustrations and parallelisms must, for the most part, be sought in the campaigns of the last three centuries. But it will not do to forget that Frederick's victory at Luthen was directly due to his knowledge of Epan, Epaminondas maneuver at Leuctra, or that the passage of the Hydaspes has been the model for the crossing of rivers in the face of the enemy ever since. All gain is breed of the successes and failures of our predecessors in the art. It is well to know what these were. While all the principles of the modern science of war are not shown in the old campaigns, because the different conditions did not call for their development, as well as because history is full of gaps. The underlying ones certainly are, and these can be best understood by tracing them from their origin. It is believed that when this series of volumes, of which this is the first, shall have reached our own times, the entire body of the art of war will have been well covered. This volume can include but a small part of it. This is not a political history. If any errors in the description of the intricate political conditions of Alexander's age have crept in, the author begs that they may be pardoned as not properly within the scope of the work. Time has been devoted to maneuvers and battles. Politics has been treated as a side issue. Individual prowess was a large part of ancient war. In Homeric times, it was especially prominent. A narrative of Alexander is apt to abound in instances of his personal courage rather than of his moral or intellectual force. The former seem to appeal more strongly to the ancients. The old historians deal almost exclusively in details of this kind, and in following them, one is instinctively led into giving much prominence to acts of individual gallantry. In olden days, troops had to be led, and the commander-in-chief was called on to give a daily example of his bravery. Troops are now moved. Brigades are mere blocks. While he needs courage as much as ever, the commander should avoid exposure to unnecessary risk. His moral and intellectual forces are more in demand than the merely physical. There are singular discrepancies between all atlases, ancient and modern. The best of maps vary in their details to an annoying extent. The maps in this volume do not aim at infallibility. They are accurate enough not to mislead. The charts are original. In many cases, topography has been created to conform to the relations of the authorities, such as the chart of Aornus. The larger part of the eastern conquest of Alexander are particularly inaccessible to the modern traveler, and no geographer has been able to secure more than general accuracy. The local topography is quite unknown. In such cases, the chart is merely suggestive and is inserted, as it were, as a part of the text. Helpfulness to the reader 
has been sought rather than artistic excellence. There are some slight variations between charts and maps, but none of moment. The scales of miles may not in all cases be quite exact. There is an occasional variation between chart and text. In such cases, the text is to be followed. The maps and charts are usually north and south. The relative sizes of the blocks of troops are not meant to be accurate. Sometimes exaggeration is restored to make the meaning of a maneuver more plain. Accuracy is not always possible. The peculiar use of the charts is to elucidate the text. Between charts and text, it is hoped that the book will be easy to read, and the author believes that a single perusal of the Battle of Arbella will make its general features as plain as those of the Battle of Gettysburg. Lest any part of the book should prove dull, so that the reader may desire to exert his right to skip short arguments at the heads of the chapters have been provided specific enough to preserve the continuity of the narrative. The cuts of uniforms, arms, and siege devices will be found interesting. Most of them have their origin in old architectural or ceramic decoration. The dress and arms of the soldiers are largely taken from Kretschmar, Rohrbox, Trachten, Der Volker, whose materials are copied from the ruins and the relics of the ancient world. Among very recent writers, the author desires to acknowledge his indebtedness to Prince Galitzin, whose just completed history of war is a well digested and ad admirably classified work drawn from all sources, ancient and modern. It has been laid under free contribution. Droysden's history of Alexander is accurate, full, and complete, but lacks the advantage of charts and maps. It has been equally utilized. From the middle of the last century, when Fullard and Guishard began their commentaries and discussions on the ancient historians up till now, there has been such a mass of matter published, often of highest value and often trivial, that its mere bibliography is tiresome. But there is no existing commentary on the great Macedonian known to the author to be of acknowledged value, which has not been consulted. The facts, however, have been uniformly taken from or compared with the old authorities themselves. The labors and commentaries of many philologists, geographers, and soldiers have now molded the ancient histories into a form easily accessible to him who possesses but a tithe of the knowledge and patience they have so freely placed at the service of their fellow man.